Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight we're going to be going over lifespan and development. Um, I thankfully did not get an hour into this before I remembered that I was on mute, so we're going to start this over. Uh, before we do, though, I did want to say a couple of things. Remember when we talked about your chapter due dates and all that stuff? So each individual chapter has a date on it. That is not necessarily the due date. That's just when you would be expected to be able to take that test. Um, the dates or the tests that do have a due date are the module tests, and all of your chapter tests have to be done that pertain to that module, as well as the module test by the date that's on that. So, for example, all the class, all the lectures that we're doing now up till the module one test have to be done plus the module on that date. Now, I understand that, you know, it, that we're living through 2012, the horror movie. Um, so due to the hurricanes and, and Mercury being in retrograde and all this other stuff that's going wrong with the world around us, um, we are removing the due date for Module 1. Now, the class will still be moving along as normal, so I don't want you to think that we're saying don't worry about the test. You are still going to have to keep up. We're going to start Module 2, and then by the time we reach the end of Module 2, you should be back to what you need to be. So even though I don't want you guys to worry so much about having Module 1 and everything done on I think Thursday is what we've got set. I'm not sure. Um, I don't want you to get too far behind. So make sure that you keep that, you know, just because you're not having to get done by that date doesn't mean you want to just put it off and not worry about it. Uh, people in Southwest Louisiana, I've had long since waived your date because of that other hurricane that hit. And now we're about to get hit. So hopefully this class goes without too many interruptions. Um, I am down in the south route right now at my original fire department planning on doing some hurricane relief throughout the night. Uh, we just actually just got done with the call, so hopefully I can get through the class without the next one getting in the way. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Let me get to the right slide. And tonight we are talking about lifespan development. So the majority of what we do in this class and what we talk about when we talk about your vital signs and what we expect somebody to do or how we expect something to operate on them. Um, we're talking about adults, right? So adults are anybody from 18 years on up to geriatric age, which is like 65 and above. So the bulk of the people you work on are going to be in this age range. That's why we focus on that first. But as we go through this, I want you to keep in mind that sometimes it's a gray area, right? So a 16-year-old or a 17-year-old physically is going to present to you the exact same as an adult. However, um, they are still minors unless there's some exceptions that have been met, like emancipated minors or something like that. Um, so when you're dealing with these people from a physiologic standpoint, you're going to run into a lot of the same issues that you would as an adult. But I want you to remember that you have physical, like physiologic adulthood and you have legal adulthood. So as we're going through this and as you go through the course, don't forget what you learned in Chapter 3. If they're legally a minor, treat them as a kid, but don't don't let that affect your uh, your patient care, because you're going to wind up you're going to wind up finding that just because they may be considered a kid doesn't necessarily mean that their vital signs are going to be that of a child or something. If they're even if they're 12 years old, if they're a 12 year old linebacker, um, you're going to find that their vital signs look a lot more like an adult's than they do a child's. The humans develop throughout their lives. Uh, we don't stop growing technically until the day we die. We're always, from, at a cellular biologic level, we're always growing. We make new cells. Um, you see that in your fingernails and toenails. You can see it in your hair. If you've ever had an injury, which all of us have for the most part. I'm not, somebody's made it to adulthood without getting a scrape or something. I kind of feel sorry for you, to be honest. But um, So, you know, we heal. Uh, these things happen. It's, it's something that a lot of times we don't think about, especially once we reach adulthood. You think you're done growing, but you're really not. So what we tend to break adults or people into, we have newborns and infants, toddlers and preschoolers, school age kids, adolescents, and then we have three stages of adulthood. We have early, middle, and older. And we're going to go over each of those tonight and basically how people act. This is kind of a, almost, this almost has a psychology aspect to it, which I like. I mean, I'm, that's always fun for me to see how people think. I love people watching, um, learning how people are going to react to things, especially in emergencies or when they get hurt, uh, knowing these behavioral aspects or knowing how somebody's psych would be, say like an elderly person, how they're going to view 
um, their need to call 911 versus, say, like a 22 year old's view of how he needs to call 911. You may find that a, a geriatric patient will be much less likely to work with you because they're afraid they're going to lose their independence. Whereas a child may be not very likely to work with you because they think you're a stranger. And that's the only thing you have to get past. So it just kind of depends on what you're dealing with. EMTs must be aware of the physical changes a person undergoes at various stages of life. All right. And they may alter their approach to patient care. So a big example of that is you know, if you walk up to a, a 30 year old and you're like, hey, my name's Rob. I'm going to be your EMT today. How can I help you? And you extend your hand hoping that they'll shake your hand and then you get a whole bunch of stuff from that, right? You get their level of consciousness, you get their orientation and their alertness, you get their, uh, you get an idea of what their skin feels like if they're diaphoretic. You see them respond to you. So you know that they have, they hopefully have some strength in their hand. They don't struggle to pick their hand up or anything like that. If you're worried about a stroke patient, uh, we get a whole lot of that stuff. But if you're going to walk up to a six-year-old and try that, they're going to shy away from you. They don't necessarily want to do that. But anyway, so we're going to start with the beginnings and we're going to work our way through the different lifespans or um, age groups. So neonates and infants. An infant is age one month to one year develop and they develop at a startling rate. They go fast. If anybody's got kids, you know this. They grow like weeds. Uh, neonate is birth to one month. So keep that in mind if you've ever heard anybody refer to an infant, even on something like CPR. An infant is not an infant the day they're born, that's a month later. So you have neonatal resuscitation care that we don't go over in this class. Uh, we've got infant CPR, that kind of thing. The leading cause of death for a neonate or an infant uh, is congenital abnormalities according to the CDC. Hold on a second. So we have a visitor. Hey, ma'am, uh, just so you know, I'm pre-recording tomorrow's lecture. You're welcome to stick around if you want to partake, uh, but you don't have to. So I'm going to keep on going. When we do a vital signs for neonates, the younger the person, the faster the pulse rate and respiration. So think about uh, things in nature. How fast does a hummingbird move versus how fast does the elephant move? The bigger we are, the, the slower things tend to go. And that's the same for humans. So uh, infants and neonates, your pulse is going to be roughly 150 beats a minute. And if you get down to an adult's pulse at that age, that's a problem. And in fact, we don't consider anything less than 60 beats a minute for a, a pulse to exist at all. We'll, we'll do compressions on a child, um, like an infant or a, a, a young, young child, say five and under. If, they're, if their pulse gets to 60, they may as well be in cardiac arrest to us because it's not enough to sustain their their body. So we'll be doing compressions on them. As they grow and as people get larger in size, then their vital signs are going to start to drop. But at birth, a pulse rate of 90 to 180 beats a minute and a respiratory rate of 30 to 60 breaths are normal. Uh, now, these numbers can change from textbook to textbook. When I was going through school, we learned 100 to 150 for the pulse and 25 to 50 for the breath. So that being said, uh, different people may tell you different numbers are normal, but as long as you're in the right area, that's okay. In other words, if you see a child with 60 for a pulse, you know that's not right. They're way off. If you see an adult breathing 60 times a minute, that's not right. That's way off. So take these numbers as guidelines. Give yourself about a five-point variance or a four-point variance on them. Um, and as long as you're within that kind of a range of the numbers you're thinking of, then you're okay. So if you don't want to remember 90 to 180, you can remember 100 to 150. Um, you can remember 100 to 200. Well, maybe not 200 because that's 20 beats above normal. But you see what I'm saying? So you can round them off if you want to. That's perfectly fine. Shortly after birth, the pulse often drops to 120 beats a minute and the respiratory rate falls to between 30 to 40 beats a minute. So they're a little bit bigger. They're going to have their vitals start to get a little bit lower. By year one, the respiratory rate slows to 20 to 30. For their blood pressure, um, the blood pressure directly corresponds to the patient's weight, not necessarily their size. So it typically increases with age. Um, that being said, so like, you know, in adults, which we'll get to, is, is 120 over 80. That's everybody's textbook idea of what blood pressure is. But a six-year-old's blood pressure is going to be much lower. 
a two-year-old's blood pressure is going to be much lower than that. So knowing how things trend, even if you don't always remember the numbers, can really help you out. If you start to see something that doesn't make sense, like a 10-year-old with 120 over 80 for a pul- or for blood pressure, typically means that there's something wrong that's really, really high for a 10-year-old. The average systolic blood pressure is 50 to 70 for a neonate and 70 to 95 for a one-year-old. So an easy way to remember this is when you're born, your top number is going to be about 50. And over the first year, it's going to double. So 50 to 100, right? Because 70 to 95, um, if you want to round that off, you can just say 100 makes it pretty simple. When we deal with weight, neonates usually weigh six to eight pounds at birth. Uh, my daughter was six pounds, seven ounces when she was born. And my son was more like a watermelon. He was pretty heavy. The head accounts for 25% of the body weight. And because of that, and what I want you to think about for this is that if we look at trauma, and we'll get to trauma toward the end of the class, but think about when something with an uneven weight distribution, what happens when it falls, right? The heavier side is going to go down first as opposed to the lighter side. So, if you know, head injuries, kids typically tend to hit head first when they fall because their heads are heavier. Um, the younger the child, the more so that is the case. After week two, infants grow at a rate of about one ounce per day, doubling their weight by four to six months and tripling it by the end of the first year. They get heavy pretty quick. But even my son, my son's 10 years old. I think he weighs like 45 pounds. He's not, he's not too heavy. Um, but he'll get up there when he's going to hit his growth spurts here soon. Anyway, all right, moving on. So cardiovascular system. At birth, the neonate makes the transition from fetal to independent circulation. Now, before they're born, they are actually not circulating their own blood. They're circulating their mom's blood, um, and that doesn't stop until you cut the cord after they're born. Once that happens, once that happens, then they're going to switch to their own um, circulatory system. Now, usually, uh, if a child is going to have a congenital heart issue, the doctor is going to know before birth. So they're going to be planning on that if you show up to the home of a mom that's getting ready to give birth. um, Unless they just haven't had any doctor care, which sometimes is the case, they don't they may not have insurance or, you know, for whatever reason, they may not have just wanted to um, get help or anything. Um, If their child is going to be giving you that kind of a problem, if you have to deliver the baby then you're going to know about it. They tend to already have that knowledge and they're prepared for it. In which a lot of times, unless it's just a, like I'd say, it's a premature birth, uh, they'll even try to induce labor when they're ready. That way they can know that the, not, the mom is in the hospital and ready for that support. But that doesn't mean that you're not going to run into an issue out there in the streets where you may be the one that delivers a child with that kind of an issue. Pulmonary system, which, as we learned from our medical terminology class, the pulmonary means the lungs. So this is to do with the breathing. Infants younger than six months are particularly prone to nasal congestion. Uh, their nasal, their nares are very, very, very small. Um, so it's important that, like, if you if you do decide to go give birth, uh, not give birth, if you decide to deliver a baby, if you have to do it in the field, one of your biggest concerns is making sure that the airway is clear. All right, so we suction that. We suction the mouth and then the nose, and we actually suction the mouth first. So if y'all want to remember that, when you get to childbirth, it'll be much easier. The rib cage is less rigid, and the ribs sit horizontally. So they're like with with an adult, the ribs tend to kind of come down and around, but um, that's because our bones have grown more solid, and they've adjusted as we've gotten bigger. When a child is born, though, they're mostly cartilage, and the ribs are flat and straight horizontal. An easy way to remember this, or if you want to think about it this way, you know how flexible children can be. They sleep in weird positions. Um, they tend to not. They're very hard. It's hard to break a child's bone. I'm not saying that they don't get injured, but um, it's usually a pretty significant hit if you actually break a bone. And the reason being is because children's skeletons are mostly cartilage. That does tend to harden up as they get older and their their skeleton grows, but early on, they're mostly cartilage. They're very pliable. Um, so we want to be careful with that because organs organs that are protected by bone, like say the ribs, aren't necessarily as protected as they should be in the event of a traumatic injury, so like a car wreck or something like that. The seatbelt safety harness on a kid's um, 
car seat could hurt them a little bit more than say if they were adults because their their, their rib cage is more pliable. Uh, the rib cage is less rigid. Like we were saying, this explains why diaphragmatic breathing happens in infants. So we talked about in uh, anatomy, how we breathe, right? When you take a breath, your diaphragm comes down and your chest wall rises. That is the adult way of breathing. Um, it's not always the case that it's going to go that way for an infant because their rib cages are more pliable. So mostly their diaphragm does the work. This makes it look like they actually are belly breathing. If you've ever heard that, um, their chest wall doesn't really rise. So you may see that where it looks like what you should normally see is an infant's belly is going to kind of poke out when they take a breath. And what that is, is that's their diaphragm doing most of the work. Infants have proportionally larger tongues and proportionally shorter, narrower airways. This is going to be a big thing to know whenever you're trying to take care of an infant that may be in cardiac arrest or respiratory arrest. Um, this airway obstruction is really common. So whereas in an adult, what we do to open somebody's airway almost kind of feels like an afterthought. We just crank the head back, stick something in their mouth, and then they're fine. Or if they gag on it, we put something in their nose, and then they're fine. Um, children are a little bit more of a fine tune than that. So, you know, for example, we don't just do a head tilt chin lift and pull a kid's head back. Actually, if you pull a kid's head back too far, you run the risk of um, pinching off the airway from the other side. So we want to be careful about that and make sure that we keep their heads in a, in a neutral position, kind of like they're sniffing. Um, keep in mind that their tongues are bigger, so they block the airway more. So it's actually more, it's really important that you use your OPA or your NPA if you're dealing with an unconscious child that can't keep their own tongue in place, um, just in case, because you want to make sure that, you want to make sure that they can still breathe properly. Or let me get to the right side. Okay, we'll just hold it there. Uh, for bag mask ventilation, remember the infant's lungs are fragile. Two forceful ventilations can result in trauma from pressure or barotrauma. And we will talk about this a lot when we get to um, the boot camp because that's when we're going to go over your skills. But the big thing to remember is that if you're using a, a bag valve mask where you're breathing for an infant, if your bag is too big for them and you make the mistake because of tunnel vision or um, any, you know, maybe you just don't realize it, um, you may, you may pop their lungs. You'll put any extra air into their stomach, but because their lungs are fragile, they could still pop. If you overinflate an adult, their lung, our lungs are typically a little bit more durable. So you're not so likely to pop our lungs, but you would probably put a lot of air into the stomach of an adult. And then you have other issues from there. So, uh, the big thing about this is you're going to watch for chest rise and uh, an infant. You may see some chest rise. You may see the belly rise a little bit. For an adult, you really, if you see a belly rise in an adult, you're putting air into the stomach. Respiratory problems can quickly become life-threatening. Infants who are struggling to breathe can quickly tire, become overheated, and even become dehydrated because they're blowing off all their moisture from the airway. The biggest thing about the airway for infants is to know that that is 90% of the time, I'll say, that's just a number I pull out of my ass, but um, the majority of the time, the respiratory issues are the reasons that they're having problems. Like say you go to a, a pediatric cardiac arrest. Usually it's not the heart that's the problem. Um, if it is, and again, they were probably born with it. They already have that medical history and everything. But the, the heart in an infant or even a child doesn't normally just go bad. Um, no, most of the time it's because they're choking on something. I mean, we talked about how the respiratory system and the cardiac system work hand in hand. So if they start choking on something, they're very quickly going to pass out. The lack of oxygen is going to slow their heart rate down. And because kids can't survive with a heart rate that's under 60, even though they still have a, a heart rate, they will go into cardiac arrest very fast because their threshold is that much higher, right? I mean, they get there a lot faster than having to go all the way to zero. So for the nervous system, uh, the nervous system continues after birth. So it doesn't, you don't have a fully functioning nervous system all the time, but some reflexes are already there from the minute you're born. So the Moreau reflex, which is where you kind of, they call it the startle reflex. If a neonate is caught off guard, it opens its arms wide, spreads its fingers and seems to grab at things. So if like, if somebody scares you as an adult, we tend to curl in and regress, like we're getting ready to, to brace for a hit. 
Um, children don't have that. The Moreau reflex is the opposite. So if you scare one, let's say you clap in front of a child or something, an infant, um, they will like splay their hands out in arms. It's almost like they're, they're reaching for support from something else. They're not, they're not trying to protect themselves per se. You have the Palmer grasp. Uh, that's everybody's favorite one because it's, you know, the little bitty hands are holding your finger and all that. But that's where if you put something into the neonate's palm, they will automatically grab it. It's a reflex. They're not meaning to do it. Even as, as cute as that is, uh, that is a reflex. So if you're checking the reflexes on a neonate and you place your fingertip in their palm, even if they're asleep, they should grab your hand. If they don't, that's a problem. That tells you that their nervous system has at least something wrong with it. Even though we're not neurologists, we don't know what it is. That reflex should be there. You have the rooting reflex, which means um, if something touches a neonate's cheek, it'll turn its head toward the touch. Kind of like it's, it know, like it thinks it's food, so it's going to kind of pull around and kind of point the mouth toward it. You have the sucking reflex that occurs when a neonate's lips are stroked. So uh, think about it like if any of you are parents, when you try to give your, your neonate um, a, a pacifier or, you know, a bottle of milk or something like that. Um, you put the, the nipple up to the mouth and the baby will automatically start sucking. It's just something they know to do. All right, so let's talk about the fontanelles for a minute. When you're born, and, and moms out there everywhere are grateful for this, the baby's head is not completely formed when the baby is born, right? They kind of come out looking like a cone head. Um, and that is because it's easier for them to pass through the birth canal during birth. There's Your skull has... Um, three main lobes that connect at the top. And when the baby is born, those lobes aren't fully fused together. They don't really fuse for a while, actually. But um, that is so that the skull can start, can condense down for birth and then come out to its normal size and normal shape after a couple of days. Um, this is a very weak point in a child. If you don't want to, you know, they always tell you don't press in the fontanelles and stuff like that. And that is common knowledge. But what is not common knowledge and what we I want you guys to know about the fontanelles is that is a big assessment point for you. When you're looking at it, when you're assessing a neonate, um, make sure you assess the fontanelles. If they are bulging, that means they've got intracranial pressure, right? There's too much pressure inside the skull and it's pushing out on the fontanelles. If they're sunk in, usually that means the baby is very dehydrated. Uh, it could be because the baby was sick and not wanting to drink formula. It could be any number of things. Sometimes it's accidental. Sometimes it's physiological. Sometimes it's abuse. So, uh, but just be aware that a sunk fontanelle, if, they, if it looks like they're just kind of sunk in, a lot of times that is for dehydration. The posterior fontanelle fuses by three months. That's the back one. And then the anterior fontanelle fuses between age nine and 18 months. So typically by the, by the time they're a two-year-old, um, the fontanelles are gone. Infant immune system maintain some of the mother's immunities for a little while uh it's not always they don't how long they last kind of just depends um but yeah starting off the reason why infants don't immediately get sick by everything out there is because they have their mother's immune system eventually that will start to wear out and then they'll, it'll be replaced by their own immune system which isn't as good at least yet so a lot of times you'll find where babies around two years old start to get a little bit sicker here's a picture of your fontanelles Again, this is right at the top of the skull. This is where your your the plates kind of fuse together as you get older. For us as adults, these are long gone. These are suture joints. Um, if you've ever seen an adult skull where it looks like they're fused together with these jagged edges, that's where the fontanelles used to be. So some psychosocial changes. Um, these begin at birth and evolve as the infant interacts with and reacts to the environment. When you're first born, like still in the hospital, um, you typically can't really see past what you can touch. Your world is very dim. Your eyes haven't gotten used to working yet. They just haven't gone into focus. So you, you know, somebody's on the other side of the room, the child's not going to really notice them. Crying is the main method of communication. Um, parents, after a while, will start to learn how the baby cries. So you can tell the difference between a cry for attention, a cry for food, uh, a cry from pain, that kind of thing. You as an EMT, you may not know how somebody's baby typically sounds. So a good question to ask if you're assessing a child is ask the parent, you know, 
is this cry normal? Does this does it sound normal for the for the baby to cry this way? The mom or the dad or the caretaker or whoever will know, and they'll be able to tell you. Um, infants develop relationships with their parents or caregivers at different rates. So, um, you know, an example of this: my daughter, she took to me almost immediately, but my son, he is, he started off as more more like a. I'm not gonna say a mama's boy, but he definitely was more about her. He he wanted to be around her. I would hold him, and sometimes he would cry, almost like, almost like I was a stranger. Not necessarily a stranger danger, but like when he got ready to to be held to go to sleep or to be comforted or something like that, he wanted his mom. Um, he was probably six months old before he stopped caring which one of us was holding him. Bonding. Or the formation of a close personal relationship is based on a secure attachment. So uh, if something is insecure, if the baby feels insecure, say like somebody hurts the baby, either intentionally or unintentionally, um, not necessarily just one time because accidents happen, but say if that nurture just isn't there, then those attachments don't form. Uh, There's a lot of studies out there and, you know, the opinion changes over time if that's the reason for certain sociological issues in some people and like i'm going to say serial killers but not just them but that's as an example um that maybe they're some of their there were some problems in the way they were raised or how their childhoods went um i will say that everybody i know with a bad childhood still suffers from issues with it to this day uh, but not like not like jeffrey dahmer kind of issues or, or anything like that um they just you know, one of my best friends, when he goes into drinking fits, sometimes it's because he's having a lot of memories of his childhood, how he, how he was dealing with issues with his parents and his brother and all that stuff. Anxious uh, avoidant attachment is found in infants who are repeatedly rejected. So, you know, they're they're not able to take care of themselves. And infants, for the most part, they know that. They don't care about their independence. That's later in life. Uh, they're mostly looking for physiologic needs to be met by people who are bigger than them who can take care of them. As long as they're getting that, they tend to grow pretty well. Um, if they're repeatedly rejected, not fed when they're hungry, not have their diapers changed, stuff like that, uh, they start. They don't build those bonds, so they start to kind of avoid people. Children can show little emotional response to their parents or caregivers and treat them as they would strangers when this happens. It's the right slide. Okay. Uh, separation anxiety is common in older infants. I remember being a kid sitting in daycare and when kids younger than me would get brought in, they would freak out bad. Like they, the mom would put them down. The, uh, the caretaker would distract them for a second while the mom jetted out the door. And as soon as the baby figured it out, baby was crying, crawling toward the window, climbing up on the, the windowsill. And, you know, I mean, it's not, it's not, it, it's tough. It, it's it's hard for them. They're just not used to being away from, from their parent or their caregiver. It does involve some clingy behavior and a fear of unfamiliar places and people. So if they're somewhere they're not used to being, it's worse. If they're at, you know, grandma's house or something like that, that they've been a couple times and they're at least familiar with it, it doesn't, it's not as bad. Trust and mistrust refers to a stage of development from birth to about 18 months, which involves an infant's needs being met by the parents or the caregivers. So if the environment is not perceived as secure, um, they develop a sense of mistrust. And that that is kind of all-inclusive. They're not getting what they need from their parents. They're not going to trust anybody. And sometimes there's a problem um, because you may suffer. If you're trying to get them to trust you with a treatment or something that you need to do for them, and they're already in that stage, they're not going to trust you anymore than they trust anybody else. Moving on to toddlers and preschoolers. Uh, we'll start with the physical changes, and then we'll get on to the psychosocial stuff as well. So a toddler is one to three years. Pulse rate's normally 90 to 150 beats a minute. So again, they've grown a little bit. Their pulse rate has come down. Their respiratory rate is 20 to 30, which if you remember um, the numbers that I like to remember for infants, the respiratory rate is 25 to 50. If you can remember those because they're pretty simple, then you can see how this one drops a little bit too. Um, 
systolic blood pressure is 80 to 100. The numbers are starting to climb because they're getting bigger. Average temperature is 96.8 to 99.6. That being said, 99.6 in an adult, you're starting to teeter on fever land. But um, children can be a little bit hotter than us. And in fact, when they run fevers, you may find where they're running a fever of like the 102. You know, which for an adult, that would melt your brain almost. But for an infant, that's sometimes they get that just because they're teething um, or for a toddler, rather. A toddler's lungs continue to develop more terminal brachials and alveoli. So they're getting better at getting oxygen into their system. Uh, yeah, we said these. Weight gain should level off. Um, Oh, wait, we're on preschoolers. Okay, so, yeah, pulse rate for preschoolers is 80 to 140. Again, you see it's starting to drop. Respiratory rate is 20 to 25. Systolic blood pressure is 80 to 100. Remember, your, your pulse and respiration has come down. Your systolic blood pressure is climbing. They're going to slow down growing in this stage. Three to six years old, they're growing, but they're not, it's not as fast of a rate. So you're going to, you know, you go to the doctor or whatever, and you're going to find that instead of gaining five pounds every visit they're more they're getting like two or three um that's normal and then they're going to start to hit growth spurts later although toddlers and preschoolers have more lung tissue they do not have well-developed lung musculature so they're not going to be very strong they're still going to be weak lungs and this prevents them from sustaining deeper rapid respirations for an extended period of time again there's a lot of um critical functions in their respiratory system that in an adult we tend to be able to compensate pretty well Children don't. When their respirations start to suffer, that's when big problems come real quick because they're at high risk of respiratory distress, respiratory failure, that kind of thing. The loss of passive immunity is possibly the most obvious development at this stage of life. They'll get sick. They get sick often. Um, kids are the world's worst about washing their hands when they go to the bathroom, about um, covering their mouth when they sneeze you know, or cough or something like that. They'll cough, they, even if they figured it out, they'll cough into their hands. Great, you know, they did what the adult said, but then they'll go and they'll touch on their friends and all that stuff and wash their hands. So the kid that's coughing because of a cold just passed it on to another kid who has no idea. Um, and because the passive immunity is starting to go away, they're going to get sick real quick. Colds often develop that may manifest as gastrointestinal distress or upper respiratory tract infection. So they're going to be complaining of the stomach aches. They're going to be complaining or coughing a lot, having that that snotty nose. All that stuff is going to be really common. Um, Toddlers acquire immunity as their bodies are exposed to various viruses and germs. Basically, the good thing is, is that once you get sick with something, you typically don't get sick with it again. Uh, not to say you won't catch another version of it, say like the cold, right? The cold and the coronavirus, they're the, that's the, the coronavirus is the cold. Uh, the reason that there's no cure for the common cold is because it's not a common disease. That's a that's a misnomer. You catch a cold, you you beat it. You catch another cold, it's a completely different variant. So you can and you you beat that one, and then you catch another cold, and you beat that one, and that's great. But there are so many versions out there that we typically die of old age before we get them all. Um, so they're you know unless they make some super potent cure all um we're just we're just gonna get, keep getting it uh it happens all through life and the more you travel the more sick the sicker you're gonna get because i'm like when i moved from new york from mississippi um i got i felt like i got hit by a freight truck by the flu almost immediately upon getting up there just because i hadn't been up there in almost 20 years and that was just for a visit uh but wasn't up there in the winter time or anything like that so i got sick real quick and it hit hard uh, that can happen to infants. That's why they try to tell you not to really do too much traveling with children in this age. If you get them out, especially during uh, cold and flu season, because they most likely will get sick. Neuromuscular growth also makes considerable progress at this age. It's toddlers and preschoolers spend time exploring by walking, running, jumping, playing catch, running headfirst into tables that are at eye level that they can't see. Um, like my glass dining room table. Preschoolers will have a brain that weighs 90% of its final adult weight. So by this point, at least as far as physical mass goes, their brain is almost a full adult size. That's why their heads are 
much bigger in comparison to the rest of their body. Um, they get to that awkward stage where they start to realize that their head is much bigger than the rest of their body. And if they fall from a height, typically as they're falling, they're going to invert and land head first because it's much more weight. Muscle mass and bone density increase, but um, again, they're not fully solid. So that's a, that's a double-edged sword. They're not very likely to break the bones, but they are their organs are still somewhat unprotected. If they're in a car wreck, they could run into an issue with that. Physiologically, toddlers have the neuromuscular con control capable of, for bladder control by about 12 to 15 months of age. Um, I know that there's like some studies out there. I think it was Freud that said that if you um, tried to potty train the child too early, it led to some issues. There's no real research to that. I think that was a Freudism that he assumed but didn't have anything to back it up because I've never seen any concrete research on that. If any of y'all have ever, if you're psych majors um, or if you've ever looked into that or heard more about it, I would love for you when you listen to this recording to reach out to me and give me more information because I'm a kind of a nerd for Freud. I like this I liked his studies. I liked his his papers and everything like that. But a lot of his stuff was kind of unfounded. So um, I'm not really sure where this particular one stands, if anybody else knows. But 12 to 15 months is a good age to start doing potty training because that's about the age that they can really start to control their bladder. Give me just a second. All right. Sorry about that. Um, if you and, and as a parent, typically just because they're physiologically able to control their bladder doesn't necessarily mean they're they're psychologically ready. So when you start working with it, if they're just not getting it, if they start to lash out, um, you know, I don't want this to kind of become a parenting class, but there are. Uh, there are some mental steps that they need to get through. So sometimes they may not be psychologically ready until 18 to 30 months of age. Um, the big thing I want y'all to know about that is some people aren't necessarily worried about their child training too soon. They worry more about their child not training fast enough. Uh, if your child is two and a half years old and they're still wet in the bed or, or something like that, or a parent's child is two and a half years old, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's anything wrong. Uh, sometimes they will call not not always 911 but there are people out there that that's the only number they know is 911 and so they'll call you and they'll ask you questions that should be asked about their from their doctor um but you're you're 911 you're supposed to know everything uh the average age for completion of toilet training is 28 months of age so you're looking a little bit over 2 years old the leading cause of death for this age group is unintentional injuries and accidents again you know, we talk about um, my daughter when she reached this age and this height. I have a big glass table that she just couldn't see it, you know, eye level with it. Um, and she was pretty quick at running. She'd be hauling tail through the house, running into the dining room at full speed and just whack right into the table. How she um, didn't hurt herself really bad, I have no idea. Uh Thankfully, it was never an injury. We actually had to keep the doors closed to the dining room because I mean, she was fine with everything else. But the way that that table is made and the, and the height of it, it was right at eye level. And she'd smack the bridge of her nose on it at full speed. Psychosocial changes. So now we're going to talk about their, their mindsets again. Toddlers or preschoolers learn to speak and express themselves. Um, and I'm talking like full English here, not necessarily mama or dada. At 36 months of age, basic language is mastered. Interaction and playing games with other children will begin, um, some better than others. 
by 18 to 24 months, cause and effect begin to become understood. So they're kind of starting to figure out if I put my hand in the fire, it will burn me. If I um, pitch a fit on the floor of a restaurant, I'm going to get my butt spanked, you know, that kind of thing. Children learn to recognize gender differences by observing role models. All right, school age kids. These are your six to 12 year olds. Uh, school age child vital signs and body gradually approach those observed in adulthood. By the time they reach 12, that's, you know, uh, nobody's in here to answer questions really, but that's when puberty begins, roughly. Uh, that's usually the end of this age group. So puberty is typically, once once they reach that, that's their exit from this age group. But their pulse rate is approximately 70 to 120, which is pretty close to an adult's range, as you're going to find when we get there. Respiratory rate is 15 to 20. Also, actually, that is in the adult range. Uh, and then blood pressure is 80 to 110, which an adult can have if they have good, you know, if they're in good shape or whatever, even even when we have adults with like injuries or something that affect their blood pressure, if they've got a pressure in that range, we typically call it good and keep on moving. Obvious physical traits and body functions change in this age group. So they're going to grow uh, about four pounds a year. This is where their growth spurts start to happen. Uh, my son is 10 years old and he's experiencing this. I remember getting the, I don't know what they're called. Um, I think just growing pains is what they always called them when I was a kid, where you like your joints start to hurt because you're growing so fast that certain things like your ligaments are going to get stretched and it hurts. It hurts to move. Um, the only time that my knees would feel good is if I bent them because it, it took some of that strain off of the ligaments that, that helped connect everything. Permanent teeth come in. Brain activity increases in both hemispheres and unintentional injuries are the leading cause of death in this age group. They're not necessarily doing things, doing stupid things like teens can do, but they're just, you know, they're climbing on things and falling off or, um, you know, they're starting to learn how to, how to cook some basic things. And so they spill hot water on themselves or they, um, they burn themselves on the stove or something like that. For psychosocial changes, sorry about that. So here's a slide for the things that we mentioned about their growth, their permanent teeth, brain activity. Psychosocial changes, children learn various types of reasoning. Um, they, they, that's why they pick up so much of it in school. They get better at things that are abstract. Um, they're not, not obviously, like I said, to the level of adolescents or adults, but they're starting to get it. They're starting to figure out that it's, there's more out there than just on and off and two plus two and things like that. Preconventional reasoning. Uh, this is where children act almost purely to avoid punishment and get what they want. Know that. All right. Um, that is actually something I've seen on tests, including the registry. I don't know, obviously, if it'll be on your test, but um, for a lifespan and development question, I've seen that one. So six, 12 year olds, they act to avoid punishment. And that includes lying. If you're, you see something like as a parent, you say, did you do this? They're going to tell you no, because they think if they say yes, then they've earned their punishment. Conventional reasoning, uh, children look for approval from their peers and society. You have post-conventional reasoning. This is where children make decisions guided by their conscience. That's going to start to happen as they get closer to adulthood. Uh, when they're in the six range, the six-year-old to eight-year-old range, they're more in the "I don't want to get in trouble" mindset. So keep that in mind. Children do begin to develop their self-concept and self-esteem. Um, you know, especially in the later years, you're in middle school at this point. Um, a lot of times, you're well aware of your body, your your the way you look. The um, you see you're, you're used to seeing yourself in the mirror. Uh, you may may very, be very unhappy with how you look because you're in that awkward stage. Um, that they start to notice it at that point, and not just in themselves, but in each other. So, your their self concept, their self esteem starts to really take form here. Self esteem is how we feel about ourselves and how we fit in with our peers, and self concept is our perception of ourselves. So. Um, an easy way to remember that if you see this on a test, there's two E's in esteem, there's two E's in peers. So you're going to see, um, if you ever have to kind of split these, these two terms up, that's what it is. 
All right, give me a second, just another second. All right. Sorry about that. These are the little interruptions that happen because I'm helping with the fire department for the storm. Um, they're just reassigning me to different different trucks and commands. All right. So adolescents, these are your teenagers, 12 to 18 years. Their vital signs begin to level off within the adult ranges. So the, um, the numbers that I give you here, you're going to see they're pretty much, they are identical to the adults. Uh, systolic blood pressure tends to be a little bit still on the low side just because they're still growing. But your pulse rate is 60 to 100. That is the exact same as an adult. Respiratory rate is 12 to 20. So the exact same as an adult. And your systolic blood pressure is between 90 and 110. That is um, a little bit low for what we consider an adult range these days just because they actually changed it. And I'll, I'll talk more of that when we get to the adults. But they raised the numbers. Um, so if you're listening along to this, give it some thought as to why you think they they changed the average range for what's normal for an adult. So adolescents experience a two to three year growth spurt, in, which is an increase in muscle and bone growth mostly and body changes. Um, growth begins with the hands and feet, then moves to the long bones and the extremities and finishes with growth of the torso. And I can see this in my son. My son. He's only 10. He's not in this group yet, but he's got some big old hands and feet. Um, if you guys have dogs, like large dogs, it's kind of the same thing. When they're still puppies, they get these huge paws. You know they're going to be big dogs. Girls generally finish their growth spurt by 16 years old. Boys are a little bit slower. My sister used to give me hell because um, she grew to her full size pretty early, like before we ever even considered driving. And I stayed small, and she gave me so much crap about, oh, you're going to be a midget, you're going to be small, blah, blah, blah. And no, I just, yeah, you know, I wasn't there yet. When I shot up, I shot way past her, but, um, you know, that didn't stop her from being a sister. When this growth spurt finishes, boys are generally taller and stronger than girls. Uh, so stronger is relative. Uh, we do typically have more muscle mass. That's what they're getting at here. That doesn't necessarily mean that boys are better than girls. I've, I actually had somebody jump on me for that statement before, so I want to make sure that I'm, I'm clarifying that um, we do build more muscle mass naturally, and it depends. Uh, I've, I've talked when I when I do personal training, I talk to people because like a guy will have fantastic upper body strength. We can do push-ups all day long. We can lift 200 plus, 300 plus pounds as as a bench press or whatever. Um, but if you ask any guy what day he hates in the gym, it's leg day. We we can't stand it, right? I mean, that's it's hard for us. Even when we're strong in the legs and we've been working on it, it's usually people, guys' least favorite days because that's not our strong point. A girl, on the other hand, might struggle with push-ups, might have to put her knees on the ground or whatever. She's not going to lift 300 pounds on the bench press and everything, but she will work circles around the guy on leg day all the time. Um, so, yes, in a sense, uh, boys are generally taller and stronger than girls, but it depends on what you're talking about. Muscle mass and bone density are nearly at adult levels at this age. And because this is the age group that starts off with puberty, their reproductive system matures. Secondary sexual development takes place. The external organs and sex organs enlarge. Uh, pubic hair grows, all this normal stuff. Voices start to change, especially in males. In girls, the breast and thighs increase uh, and menstruation begins. By the middle of adolescence, boys are able to produce sperm, eggs begin to develop in girls, and 
um, girls, you're going to have all the eggs you're ever going to get when this happens. Y'all, you don't produce them over time. Once they produce, they produce. Um, guys produce sperm as they need it. So thankfully, we are not limited in that supply. Um, acne can also occur during due to hormonal changes because your body's going to start to produce more skin oils. And unintentional injuries are the leading cause of death for adolescents. Uh, these start to get more in the just stupid decision category, but they're still unintentional injuries. Um, they, you know, nobody, nobody says hold my beer because they want to get hurt. For your psychosocial changes, adolescents and their families often deal with conflict as adolescents try to gain control of their lives from their parents especially if the way they feel tends to uh, differ greatly from the way their parents are raising them. A lot of times that rebellious stage can get pretty bad. I've been fortunate. My kids have been little angels, at least to me, um, because I haven't tried to pull them away from where, what they've wanted. They haven't wanted anything too outlandish. I've never had to kind of argue with them on, on things. They've never asked for something that made me scratch my head and be like, no, you can't do that or anything. So we've, we've not had that problem. Privacy becomes an issue and self-consciousness increases. Adolescents may struggle to create their own identity, especially if they're early on in the stage. They see their parents. They, they give it some thought. Is Am I going to be like my parents? Am I going to be like my Uncle Ryan? Am I going to be like my friend down the street? You know, I'm going to be myself. What, what do I want to be? They don't necessarily know. Uh, and because of that, they can change almost daily in what they like and don't like. They often want to be treated like adults but cared for like younger children. Uh, what was that saying? They're, they're too old to be a kid, too young to be an adult. I forget. Anyway, antisocial behavior and peer pressure tend to peak at age 14 to 16. Uh, that's, that's pretty common. That hit me. You know, I was shy in those days. Didn't really talk to anybody. I came out of my shell toward the end of high school, but I suffered from this uh, while I was still trying to figure out who I was because I didn't know. Smoking, illicit drug use, and unprotected sex are problems that may arise. Um, a lot of times it's because even though they're taught that these things can cause problems for them, they adolescents can kind of have like a God complex where they don't they don't really think that they're going to get hurt. They're never going to, um, they, you know, they, they're not going to die. That in, These injuries, yeah, it may, they may get a scratch, but they, they're not going to lose a leg or anything. That doesn't happen to them. Eating disorders can arise in, a, in adolescence from an attempt to gain self-control through what they eat. Um, they are fighting for their independence. The more they feel like they don't have it, the more because they, they don't really have control over their schedule. They have to go to school whether they want to or not. They don't have control over some things at the house, so they're fighting to control what they can. And sometimes that manifests in bad ways. And then you as an EMT, you're going to see kind of the greatest hits of what can go wrong because that's, you know, they're calling you for 911. Adolescents may show a greater interest in sexual relations. Uh, a code of personal ethics develops based partly on the parents' ethics. A lot of times we do inherit our parents' values, our you know our parents' political beliefs, our parents' religious beliefs, so on and so on. But um, they even if they start off like that, as they get older, they're going to start to mold it themselves. They'll start off with their parents' views, and then as they gain experiences, they might they might get some experiences to make them question that. And then so they, they could change it as they go. Uh, many adolescents are fixated on their public image and are terrified of being embarrassed. I have worked calls where like a, like a two car accident, this, this, or I'm sorry, one car accident, this girl hit a tree. Um, she's like 16, 17 years old. And I'm in there watching her die in front of me. Um, and her only concern, her biggest concern out of everything, what had nothing to do with her mortality. She didn't care. She wanted to know whether her face was disfigured or not. She was worried that she had cut her face up and that her wounds wouldn't heal. She didn't give a damn about the fact that she might, she might not live past that accident. She only cared about how she looked. Um, and that wasn't vanity. That was just, that's what her priorities were at the time. Because again, like I said, you know, adolescents don't, they don't think about their mortality. They know that nobody lives forever, but they just, you know, that's coming later. Think about when you were a kid. My dad was 21 years old when I was born. So when I was 15 years old, he was only 36 years old. I'm 37. Um, so I know at 37, 
that I'm not I'm not old. You know, uh, I realize that now. But when I was 16, I thought or 15, I thought my dad was ancient. Like I just I knew his age, but it was so far above mine. And he had always, for as long as I had known him, been so far above my age. He was an adult from the day I met him that um, I just thought that, you know, I would never catch that. I was like, I'm young. He's still alive. I got no problems. I got nothing to worry about. And that made my own mortality very far from my priority, the top of my priority list. And that's, that's kind of the same case with a lot of people. Um, they worry about more of what's in front of them, which they're learning from pop culture and each other. You know, what are they wearing to school? Are they, are they wearing the right brands? Are they wearing the right sizes? These kind of things. That's what they care about. And it will, it'll throw you for a loop when you're trying to save somebody's life and they're just worried about what their face looks like. Adolescents are at a higher risk than other populations for suicide and depression because of these things. They base all of their priorities on their social life, their social standing, um, and things like that. And if something happens, if they lose a friend, they lose a relationship, a lot of times that is world rocking to them, you know, and, and people in other age groups like us at the older ages, we tend to forget that that their priorities are different. So we're looking at them like, what is wrong with you? Like, that is nothing, you know, because our, our priorities have changed. Our experiences have changed. And we have forgotten that when we were that age, it was the same. We expect we older people, and this is in all age groups, older people forget that when they were the younger people, they had the same issues. So, you know, you hear about people like, Generation X talks about millennials like they're just the worst thing out there. Um, the baby boomers talk about Generation X like they're the worst thing out there. It's just that's just how it goes. Everybody looks at the people younger than them and be like, "You're idiots," and they forget that they were there themselves. Early adults, so nineteen to forty years old. I like the fact that I am still an early adult. I'll take that. Uh, your physical changes, your vital signs do not vary greatly from those seen through adulthood. So your pulse rate will average 70 to um, 70 beats a minute and range from 60 to 100. So the range is still the same, but you're sitting at about 70 typically. Um, you're going to find people in worse shape tend to have a higher pulse. People that are exceptionally small tend to have a higher pulse, but you're going to be in that range somewhere um, or near it. Respiratory rate will stay in the range of 12 to 20. That one's pretty much law. Like once you hit the 12 to 20 range, it doesn't change. Systolic blood pressure will be between 90 and 140. They did raise that number. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and talk about that now. The reason that they have raised it is because we have found that since most people suffer from hypertension, um, which is just high blood pressure, um, we realize that it's not necessarily that we're suffering from it. Like there, there's people with, borderline hypertension, mild hypertension that are perfectly fine. There's no symptoms. So yeah, they are, they're meeting hypertensive, um, issue. They're, they're, they're meeting the, the definition of hypertension by the book. And that's becoming the problem. We as a society and not just Americans, we just around the world. Um, over the years, our baseline has risen a little bit. So, you know, 120 is textbook. Um, they used to say, I think it was 130 was considered hypertension. Now it's 140. Doesn't mean you're going to have problems. Again, we treat our patients, not our numbers. So if you see somebody with 140 for a blood pressure, you can ask them what's up if they, if anything's bothering them, but there may not be. Um, and that's okay. So just because the numbers don't necessarily line up, doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with your patient. So, but that being said, if the numbers do wind up in the range and you, you look at your patient and they look like they're about to die in front of you, don't just be, well, your numbers are good, so I'm not going to do anything. That's not how you want to watch your patient die on you. From age 19 years to shortly after 25 years, the body should be functioning at its optimal level. You've heard people say you're in your prime and everything, or um, youth is wasted on the young. I've heard things like that. This is what they're referring to from 19 to 25. You're in peak physical potential, uh, whether or not you actually do that or not. You look at sports stars, the ones that are 19 to 25 years old are usually the ones rocking it the best. And then after that, they start to go downhill. Um, your lifelong habits are solidified. The body is working at peak efficiency, but 
as early adulthood continues, subtle erosion begins. So once you cross 25, you start to lose your prime. And then you don't just start breaking. It's not like a, uh, you know, a warranty running out or anything like that. But um, you do start to, you'll start to see like, all right, well, I can still lift as heavy as I want in the gym or run as fast as I want. But you know what? I don't recover like I used to. I can go out and have my all night benders after class, but the hangovers hit me a little bit harder, you know, that kind of thing. Um, discs in the spine begin to settle and weight sometimes, or I'm sorry, in height sometimes will shrink. I was 6'3 when I was in school. I'm closer to 6'2 now. It's partly because I've gotten older. It's partly because I've gone for the last 15 years as a firefighter with the weight of my gear on me and people if I've had to carry them and things like that. So I've, I have shrunk. Um, and that's that's a normal thing, even if you work in a in a job that doesn't do that. So for you guys listening to this in the class, if you're listening to this just because you wanted to hear our classes, uh, let me drop some personal training info in here as well. If you can get a hold of a pull up bar or like some straps to hang from or anything like that, if you can hang from the top of your door frame or the, the pull up bar at the gym or whatever, add that into your daily routine. Because what that does is it allows your spine to stretch and you'll feel like a million dollars if you do that. Uh, It helps fight that shrink. Fatty tissue and weight will increase. So the older we get, the harder it is to get rid of that weight. So if you can stay in good shape when you're younger, you won't have to fight the weight gain as you get older. Muscle strength decreases and reflexes will slow. Um, Again, we're not talking about like drunk level slow, but you may have a hair shorter or hair longer time frame when you're dealing with your your senses your psychosocial changes life centers on work family and stress everybody worries about their career at this point during this period adults strive to create a place for themselves in the world and many do everything they can to settle down Um, a lot of people they want to grow their career they're looking for that prestige of being in management of being a leader or a business owner or um you know, a job description that, that has some value to it. We put a lot of, of emphasis on that. Um, but most people don't just worry about work. You got the other half, half of life as well, which is like marriage and family. Um, and, you know, for some people, some genders in our society, it's easier than others. Uh, I know that when I was in this age group, we'll say, um, the women that I know, they pretty much had to choose one or the other. It was not easy for a woman to say, I'm going to start a family and a career. Because if you started one, the other one had to take a back seat. Now, I don't know today. I know that in my age group, it's a little bit easier because we've grown our careers. But uh, I imagine that since it wasn't that long ago, it probably hadn't changed. But despite all of the stress and change, um, this is one of the most stable or one of the more stable periods of life. I don't know if I'd say stable, but I will say the most enjoyable. I was homeless, carless, slept at the at the store I worked at. Um, I slept in dorms. I slept on couches. I slept in on the street. Slept at the local park. I, you know, I've legit been homeless in this age group. But um, I look back on it, and I I would do it again. You know, maybe not the homelessness, but the uh, the my my I, I don't know. I guess it felt lighter. Like even though things are more stable now, um, it comes with stress. Middle adults. So this is 41 to 60 years old. This is what we typically call midlife. Your vital signs are going to stay the same. Your average pulse rate remains roughly 70, but you're still in that 60 to 100 beats a minute. Your respiratory rate continues to be 12 to 20. Your blood pressure remains between 90 and 140. Um, but this is where your senses really start to kind of go away. So middle adults are vulnerable to vision and hearing loss. Cardiovascular health becomes an issue. Cancer incidence increases. Menopause takes place in the late forties, early fifties. And that is a, that is like a second puberty for women. That's they're going through some major changes, both physically and mentally at that point. Diabetes, hypertension, and weight problems are common. Exercise and a healthy diet can diminish the effects of aging, but um, if you guys listen to anything I say as advice is don't wait until you're in this age group to start that journey because it's really, really hard to come back from a lifetime of bad diet and nutrition or um, exercise. 
unintentional injuries are the leading cause of death in age 41 to 44. Uh, cancer is the leading cause of death once you get past that. So 45 to 60 is when, if you're going to get cancer, I'm not going to say you're going to get in this age group, but this is where the chances are, you know, the odds are not in your favor. Um, and a lot of times that's what gets you. Psychosocial changes. Let me get to the right slide. Psychosocial changes focus is on achieving life goals, right? So sometimes they'll go back and they'll get goals that they missed. The uh, the midlife crisis may set in. You may want to go get that sports car you never got. You want to get that position you never got. Um, you're still trying to accomplish the things you set out to do when you were making your goals in that previous age group. Middle adults may must readjust their lifestyle as children leave home. The empty nest syndrome is a very big thing. Um, that is a huge cause of depression, and it's also a big driving factor in why people will make drastic changes in their day-to-day -day life. Finances become a worrisome issue because you're looking at retirement more. Um, you know, a lot of times our health is starting to fail at this age, so we're starting to wonder if we're going to be able to afford the, the medical bills. Um, if you have a family and your kids are growing up, you're worried about college making sure that you can afford college, it really starts to become an issue for finances. I know when I was in my early adulthood, like, well, I'm still technically by the numbers, but when I was in my early 20s, I didn't care. I just needed to make sure I had enough money for food. I can't tell you how many times my power got cut off because I didn't have the money to pay the bill. And it, even when I knew it was coming, it didn't bother me. I don't, you know, very immature, but I just, that was the, the mindset at the time. I was like, well, I can eat. My physiologic needs are met, um, and the roof will keep the rain off of me whether or not I have power. It's not the best outlook, but uh, it was it was accurate. Generally, people of this age have the physical, emotional, and spiritual reserves to handle life's issues. They're pretty resilient. Uh, at this point, they've kind of figured out what they need to do. Middle adults may find themselves caring for children leaving for college and caring for their aging parents as well. So this is where, again, you know, we talk about medical bills, things like that. Uh, finances, your people in this age group get spread pretty thin because they have to take care of themselves first and they got to take care of their kids who are, might be like me and just horrible with money at that age. Um, take care of aging parents who their health is failing, um, their independence is starting to erode, that kind of thing. Older adults? Older adults include those ages 61 years and up. Um, Physical changes, your life expectancy is constantly changing. So, you know, um, let's see, it says here. Well, actually, it doesn't say it on this slide, does it? You know, if you go back far enough, life, life expectancy was like in the 40s. If you made it to 50 years old, you were ancient. Um, now we're at 78 years. The age to which a person will live is based on many factors, including year of birth and country in which the person lives, uh, the environment they used to live in, if they've been around factories and things that have hurt their respiratory system over the years, if there's things that could lead to cancer. Um, there's a lot of things that play into it. How do they live their life? Do they eat healthy and work out? Do they eat bacon and Burger King all day, every day? Uh, the coffee and cocaine diet. I mean, you know, yeah, it's great for losing weight, but it's not good for long term. Public health advances, changes within diets, attitudes regarding exercise, like I was saying, advances in access to medical care, and personal behaviors. These can all lead into how long somebody will live. I've noticed that people in the South tend to die in there. I think I will say that 70 is probably a good average, right? People live into their 60s. I've, I've had people pass away in their 60s or 70s, whatever. I have lost count of the amount of people I've seen live to be over 100. Um in the northern states. I don't know. I guess it's just access to better care. Um, the people up there, the culture is a little bit more onto the healthy lifestyle, things like that. And I think that's a big factor to it. Cancer is the leading cause of death in this age group, 61 to 65. And after that, heart disease edges it out. So 65 and older, you really start to see more cardiac issues. And those are the ones that are taking people from us. Your vital signs depend on the patient's overall health, medical conditions, the medications they take. Uh, so when you're when you do an assessment, for example, if you're dealing with an older adult, you really want to get their medical history, and that may be something as simple as, or their medication list could be something as simple as I take aspirin on the daily, 
or they may just hand you a shoebox full of pills and say, here's what I take. I don't even know. Um, some of the medications that they take will directly affect their vital signs. And we talked about beta blockers the other day. If, if there's a patient with a known cardiac history that takes labetalol, which is a beta blocker, anything that ends in an LOL at the end, that's a, typically a beta blocker. Those meds are designed to keep their heart rate from getting over a certain amount. And the more they take, the more it pushes their heart rate down. Um, so if you see a patient and you're looking at vital signs, and we learn how vital signs tend to trend together. If you see vital signs that don't make sense where, you know, based on the other vitals, their heart rate should be over 100. But it's not. Um, a lot of times that may be due to some medicine that they take. Older adults are often able to overcome numerous medical problems, but they may need help, but they may need multiple medications. Ooh, sorry. All right. On their cardiovascular system, this is where you start to see a big decline um, as they get older. Cardiac function declines with age, largely due to atherosclerosis, which is a hardening of their arteries. Cholesterol and calcium build up inside the wall of blood vessels, forming plaque. Um, and the accumulation of plaque eventually leads to partial or complete blockage of blood flow. Now, that is just dealing with what is stably in the artery. Um, if something breaks off from that plaque, you've got a whole other problem, which we'll get to. But atherosclerosis is referring to the plaque buildup in the arteries, and, and that is strictly that. We're not talking about the stuff that breaks off. Uh, more than 60% of people older than 65 have atherosclerotic disease. And this is, you know, at least for a long time there, uh, this was the leading cause of death in firefighters. This is, I, cancer has taken it over. That's why there's such a big push to get us things like an extra set of gear. Um, gear cleaning has become such a big deal now. The way, where we store our gear is, is big. You know, they, they don't, it used to be just common knowledge and, and courtesy not to bring your, your dirty ass gear into the station where people are eating and stuff like that. Now, um, it's pretty much law. You can't do that. Uh, that's one of the reasons why they don't like, you know, I don't, I don't like seeing pictures of babies in their dad's gear. I'm like, yeah, it's, it's, it's cool and all, but you basically just stuck your infant in a, in a, a pile of cancer. So that's, that's a big oof. Um, so heart rate and cardiac output will decrease getting back on track here. Let me make sure I'm on the right slide. Yep. Okay. Um, cardiac output can no longer meet the demands of the body. The vascular system becomes stiff because of the, the plaque buildup. And yes, as we age, we start to lose that, that rubbery pliability of our vessels. Diastolic blood pressure will increase because the, the vessels can't expand as needed for the, uh, to keep a good pressure. So when they kind of constrict down, that number will start to climb. The heart must work harder to move the blood effectively. That becomes an issue, um, which is the reason why we give nitros. Nitros just uh, ease up the workload on the heart, and we'll get into the details of that later on. But that's what we're doing a lot of times. And same thing with beta blockers. Those are medications that try to keep the, load, the workload of the heart down. The ability to produce and replacement blood cells declines, especially as our bones start to become brittle, as does the blood volume. The respiratory system, um, change, some changes here. The size of the airway increases and the surface area of the alveoli decreases. So think back to when we talked about the anatomy of the respiratory system. Let's start with the airways first. As we age, the, the size of the airway will increase. All right, that's typically not a bad thing, all right, because that would get more air in. That's not a problem. Um, what becomes a problem, though, is that surfactant which if you've taken an anatomy class, I know we didn't go over this stuff in anatomy because I don't want you to, I didn't want to overload you any more than you already were in chapter six. But um, your airway produces a, like a, a, a gunk on its own. It, and it's supposed to do this. Um, and it's, a, it's basically a lubricant. It's a surfactant. So as, as air passes through it, it doesn't chafe or, or chap up your airway. Um, that can start to erode away the airway gets a little bit bigger. Now you're bringing in more air. You're more likely to cause that pain in the airway. That's why a lot of people 
when they get up in age, they really start wanting to kind of move to the more humid climates, like down here, they'll go to Florida, those kind of things. It's a, it's a natural thing because it's easier on them physiologically. Um, but the big thing that I want to point out is, like it says, the alveoli decreases the surface area. So think of your alveoli like broccoli. All right. You've got bulbs, multiple bulbs on every branch of alveoli. The capillary bed that sits on them covers all that surface area. So the more surface area you've got, um, the more areas you've got where you can have that oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange when you breathe. So you get better respirations. But as we age, some of that surface area decreases. You go from nice, real round bulbs to more of just one big bulb with a couple of lumps. And because of that, you don't have as much surface area. Um, which means you don't really get good gas exchange that well. So your breathing starts to suffer. Now, this is just from age. There are diseases out there, which we'll talk about in the next, well, not the next module, but module three, like COPD from um, smokers and stuff like that. That's kind of one of the issues there is that you're taking a normal life process that's, a, that's bad and we, you know, it's going to come eventually and you're speeding it up. Um, but that, that surface area decrease does happen with age. Natural elasticity of the lungs decreases. So the intercostal muscles are used more to breathe. That's the muscles between your ribs. Um, so your chest wall is working harder and breathing becomes more labor intensive. Breathing should be effortless. And even as we age, especially in this age group, um, you really shouldn't be struggling like, like, a, like a CHF or a COPD patient would struggle. But, um, you probably won't be running very many marathons unless you've been doing it your whole life and you've been conditioned for it. All right. Um, the changes in the respiratory system are often gradual and they go unnoticed until a severe life-threatening condition occurs. And that can be anything from a car wreck to um, something medical. Maybe they breathe in something that closes off the airway like a, an asphyxiant. Um, I know the town that I, li that I grew up in, Poplarville, in the 90s had a, um, the town, the neighboring town in Louisiana is Bugaloosa and their paper plant there had a gas leak or a uh, chemical leak. This is back when I was in like sixth or seventh grade. Um, but that stuff took the paint off the fire trucks and a lot of the people that were in it because, the, you know, it happened without warning. There a lot of people in the town, a lot of the firefighters, they had no warning. Uh, we lived far enough away to evacuate over in Mississippi, but um, people that were in Bugaloosa weren't so lucky. And that stuff really hit a lot of people's respiratory issue, um, systems that were normally healthy, but they were getting up in age. And it's kind of like how COVID now, you know, older adults, all the most of your older adults that are suffering and dying from COVID are dying from respiratory issues. Kind of the same thing, what I'm getting at here. Within the nose and mouth, uh, there is a gradual loss of the mechanisms that protect the upper airway. So the cilia, the nose hairs, all that stuff that protects your upper airway, that starts to go away. Um, this leads to a decreased ability to clear secretions as well as decreased cough and gag reflexes. So you hear old people trying to clear their throat and it's they're trying and trying and trying. That's that's a, just a natural part of aging. Um, and aspiration and obstruction become more likely. So if you're Working on a, a patient, it's much you have to pay a lot more attention to their airway if they're up in age because their tongue secretions that, that build up in their throat and all that can become, uh, they can include their airway that much faster. And without the gag reflex being as good as it is, they're a lot more likely to choke on things like steak as well. That's why you really don't see elderly people eating a lot of things that they have to work hard to chew. Um, or things like that. They, their their diet tends to become more soft texture focused. Um, it's just it's easier for them to chew. Uh, a lot of times their taste buds aren't may they they may either depending because like uh, my uh, some of my family can't have spicy foods not because their taste buds can't handle it but because their digestive tracts can't handle it. Uh, a lot of times your senses do start to kind of decrease so they may not notice that something is as high as it is. They're, they're not going to taste it to the same way that we do. As the smooth muscles of the lower airway weaken with age, strong inhalation can make the walls of the airway collapse inward and cause inspiratory wheezing. Um, 
we didn't talk about this so much. I, I'm, I don't know if I mentioned it or not when we were in the anatomy chapter. But um, we have like like they're shaped like the letter C. They're cartilage rings that um, protect our airway. So we have we have a rigid airway that way when you're breathing in, you don't have the issue of your airway collapsing like a straw every time you try to take a breath. But as we get older, that that cartilage tends to weaken. Those those structures that keep the airway from collapsing tend to weaken. So sometimes if they're really struggling to breathe, you're going to see that where their their airway starts to kind of collapse a little bit and they'll wheeze from it. Is unfortunately there's not a lot we can do other than try to get their breathing intensity to calm down. Cells of the immune system are less functional, and by age 75, the vital capacity may amount to only about 50% of the vital capacity of a young adult. So factors include loss of respiratory muscle mass, which we talked about, increased stiffness of the thoracic cage. Again, as we grow, we our cartilage turns to bone, and the more it becomes solid bone, the less it's going to be um, flexible and movable. So our rib cage starts to get harder and harder to move up and down. Decreased surface area available for the exchange of air we talked about with the with the alveoli. Um, but your residual volume increases with age. So when you breathe out, uh, easy way to think about this. When you breathe out, even if you try to consciously push all the air out of your lungs, there's still going to be some in there. We have it's called PEEP, uh, P-E-E-P, which is positive end expiratory pressure. So if you were to just take a big old breath and just as hard as you could, um, you'll get red in the face and your body will force you to stop before you blow all the air out of your lungs. Your lungs will always remain a little inflated. Um, but a lifetime of breathing, especially breathing air with high levels of pollution, can cause an accumulation of pollutants in the lungs. Um, a lifetime of breathing in general, you're eventually going to get to where that end expiratory pressure, let's say it's 10 millimeters. 10 millimeters of mercury at in your 20s, you may be pushing 20 or 15 to 20 or whatever um, when you're in your 60s, that kind of thing. And the problem with that is, is the more air that stays in your lungs residually, the less air the lungs can hold when you breathe in, right? Because they're already, you know, 10% capacity is filled, um, have 90% to work with. And then as you get older and that, that, that in, that end pressure starts to build that stays in there, the remaining capacity of the lungs starts to drop. All right, for your endocrine system, um, insulin production drops off and metabolism decreases. So it gets easier to gain weight based on what you eat. Um, you're also going to run into problems with energy production. People run into problems with diabetes as they get older, especially if they haven't been really making the best choices in their nutrition. Sometimes it's out of your control. Uh, people do tend to slow down their physical activity, which aids to their weight gain. It also aids to their, their muscle depletion, their bone brittle, and all these things kind of play into it. But they tend not to decrease their food intake, especially in our country. We just eat everything we can. And at least in the South, where you guys are at and where I'm from, if we can't fry it, we don't want it. The pancreas may not be able to produce enough insulin for the person's body size, which can lead to diabetes mellitus. And at that point, we're talking about type 2 diabetes, which we will get into in its own chapter. The reproductive system changes to some extent. Uh, men are able to produce sperm long into their 80s, but the rigidity of the penis tends to decrease over time. So they do make pills for that. Uh, but at some point, even the pills aren't going to help you. Women have a decrease in the size of their uterus and vagina that typically happens after menopause is because the body has said, you know what? We have done our time. We don't need to make any more babies. Hormone production for both sexes gradually decreases as they age. It happens at a different rate for some people. It happens early for some people. Um, it happens late sometimes, I mean, if you're lucky enough to have that. Sexual desire may diminish with age, but it does not cease. And... Um, as a gee whiz, that tends to be for the males. Women's sexual desire tends to raise as they get older. For your digestive system, changes in gastric and intestinal function may inhibit nutritional intake and utilization in older adults. Um, your taste sensations will decrease. So again, you know, we talk about 
the spices and everything. When people say they can't handle spicy food, a lot of times they're talking about where they have like a gastric ulcer or heartburn or, or you know, some kind of indigestion that's going to come from it. It's not necessarily that they're sitting there going, oh, that's hot. It burns my tongue. Um, saliva secretion decreases. And this reduces the body, the body's ability to process complex carbs because complex carbs take a lot longer to digest. That's why you know their their branch chains are bigger. Um, and since digestion starts in the mouth with your saliva, if you don't have enough, a lot of times that food will pass through you undigested. Um, so, for your own sake, or if you're if you're talking to somebody and like, let's say you make a proactive uh, welfare check. If you show up and you're trying to talk to them about ways that they can, they can get more, more benefit from their nutrition. You can tell somebody to chew longer. Um, You know, don't be so quick to swallow the food. Chew it. If you, if you chew it more, it gives your body more time to produce that saliva per, per bite. The ability of the intestines to contract and move food diminishes. Gastric acid secretion diminishes. I cannot wait for that because um, of my heartburn. Gallstones become increasingly common. Um, they do. In fact, most people have them just chilling out in the gallbladder. As long as the gallbladder doesn't get full, it's not a big deal. Um, that is common. I've seen plenty of x-rays, MRIs, ultrasounds, all this stuff. Maybe not x-rays, but um, MRIs and ultrasounds especially where we're looking inside of somebody's gallbladder and it just looks like a bag of rocks. The anal sphincter changes can produce fecal incontinence. Uh, you do see that sometimes in older adults. I know that sounds gross, but you guys being EMS, you're going to run into this. So um, be ready for that. A lot of problems with the elderly happen while they're going to the bathroom uh, because they hit the vagus nerve. Different things like that go wrong, especially for cardiac patients. But um, even that aside, they just can't hold it like they used to. You know, um, when you're young, you can hold it for as long as you need to. There's people that hold their hold for days if they need to or whatever. But when you get a little bit older and you got to go, you got to go. For renal systems. So we're talking about the kidneys here, basically. The filtration function declines by 50% from age 20 to 90. You can function fine with kidneys if they're like 20 percent each i mean you you're not at kidney failure at that point you're just you're you're pretty far down but um i don't remember what the actual number is where they say all right it's time for dialysis but it's pretty low kidney mass decreases 20 percent over the same span and due in part to the decreased effectiveness of the blood vessels that supply blood to the nephron the nephrons are the kidneys, the cells that make them up. There is a decreased ability to clear waste from the body, and there is a decreased ability to conserve fluids when needed. So these are the issues that typically lead people to uh, dialysis. And these are also the issues that tend to make people have to call 911 when they don't go to dialysis because, you know, they get sick or it's cold outside. It's six degrees in Buffalo in the middle of January, and they don't want to go to dialysis. So they don't. And then all of a sudden, they've got way too much potassium in their body, which is going to cause their heart to have problems. It's going to cause um, all kinds of other different issues with their nervous system and everything. So those are the kind of causes that we're going to get called out to. You see that a lot in the winter because that's when flu season's kicking in. It's cold. People don't want to go or they can't go. Um, it's going to be interesting this year because we're going to have COVID on top of that. So especially in, in dialysis, you know, the elderly are susceptible to this as life threats. Um, I wonder, I've actually been wondering how dialysis units are planning on dealing with COVID, especially when, when the colder season comes and people are more susceptible to getting sick. So with the nervous system, moving on from my own little ramblings, in the central nervous system, the brain weight may shrink from 10 to 20% by age 80. Uh, your motor and sensory neural networks can become slower and your neurons are lost. But there is not a loss of knowledge or skill. So people don't get dumb when they get older. All right. People might get slower. Their reflexes will slow. But it's not your knowledge and skill that shrinks with age. It's just your ability to physically do things. So 
Um, the reason I point that out is if anybody has ever wanted to go to an elderly person for advice or something, if they're lucid and, and there's no, say, like Alzheimer's kicking in or anything, they're in their right mind or whatever, the knowledge they have is invaluable. Um, it's priceless. They've got a lifetime of knowledge. They've had a long time to learn their skills and their trades and everything. And this is really, really good to sit down and just talk to somebody. Some of the best times I had as a CNA was just talking to the elderly and getting to know them. In fact, that's the reason why I'm not a CNA anymore is because I got attached to everybody. Um, they got attached to me. And, and every time somebody died in the home, it was like losing my grandfather all over again. So I didn't want to do that. Um, I just, I didn't have it. I didn't have it in me. EMS is much better. I see you at a bad time. I fix you and I send you on your way. Um, sleep patterns can change. In younger adults, the brain, which is surrounded by the meninges, takes up almost all the space in the skull. But as we age and the brain shrinks, that is no longer the case. Age rating shrinkage creates a void between the brain and the outermost layer of the meninges, which provides room for the brain to move when stressed. Now, the important thing about this, as you can see in the slide, if you have an elderly patient that's in a wreck and they hit their head, or even if they don't, if they show no outward signs of trauma because they didn't hit anything, uh, we're going to learn about in the next chapter or two the physics of the mechanism of injury and why we worry about the mechanism of injury. It's because we're basically a big sack of organs, and it's, there's no different in the skull. So... Even if your head doesn't hit the windshield or anything like that, you run the problem, you run the risk of your brain hitting the, the front of your skull. Um, all the blood vessels from the body that run up the neck to feed the brain, they attach. And some of them, um, like your veins, your veins are inside the, the skull cavity with the brain. Your arteries are outside closer to the skull. Um but the attachments all kind of run through and, and even the arteries eventually go into the brain area because they got to get that oxygenated blood in. If your brain is not taking up the whole cavity and you hit something, the um, the momentum of the of the crash and everything in Newton's law, your brain's going to keep moving until it smacks the front of your skull. The more space there is, the more the brain can move. And then the problem with that is, is that it will shear those vessels and then you wind up with the brain bleeds um, these hemorrhages, as you can see in the picture on this slide. That's where we worry about that. And the problem there is that you won't see this blood. Uh, this is internal bleeding, but you're going to see the altered mental status of your patient. But then at the same time, it's we want you to be aware of this because some people think that um, if somebody, like if an elderly patient has an altered mental status, it could be something chronic, right? It could be Alzheimer's. It could be dementia. We don't know. Um, if you see this in trauma, don't don't fall into those traps of well maybe they just have maybe they just have chronic um, issues. Uh, we need to get into a hospital because if what's happening in this picture is happening to your patient, it will kill them very quickly. Peripheral nerve sensation is diminished. Moving on further, increased reaction times cause longer delays between stimulation and motion. So like if an elderly person is driving down the road and something causes, something happens that would make them want to slam the brakes, the reaction time of them realizing it and then actually hitting the brakes will be a little bit longer. The resulting slowdown in reflexes and decre decreased kinesthetic sense may contribute to the incidence of falls and trauma. Um, same thing. If something happens to knock them off balance, their ability to adjust or grab something is slower, they're much more likely to go ahead and fall. For their sensory changes, most older adults can see and hear well. Um, they may need glasses or hearing aids. And I want to say this, usually when you lose hearing, you're losing it in a range. So think of it like music. You, you may no longer be able to hear the bass guitar, but you can hear the rest of the song. Or you may no longer be able to, if you listen to, if, you, if you're a marching band geek like I was, you may not be able to hear the flutes anymore, but you can hear all the brass instruments. That's what the kind of hearing loss that typically tends to happen as we age. Um, and the reason being is because we lose some of the finer hairs in our um, middle and inner ear that aid our hearing, that when sound passes through, they vibrate. But if those hairs tend to go away over time, over the years, we lose them. They're just not there. So when um, the frequencies that make them vibrate pass by, they're no longer there to do that. And then we don't hear it. Um, if you're over 25 years old, 
you have already experienced some of this hearing loss. There's little little videos out there on YouTube you can find that we were messing with each other with this at work at, at the base a couple months ago. Um, it's a really, really, really high pitched sound. And if you play it, all the 18 year olds in the room are going to start grabbing at their ears, wondering why it hurts so bad and they can hear this noise. Um, but everybody like 25 and older is looking around like, what's going on? Why is everybody acting weird? Um, and of course, you know, age is being just a guideline. Um, cause there was one, one sound that one of my, one of my coworkers played, he couldn't hear it, but it was, it was like mind piercing to me. I could still hear it. Um, it was just a really high pitch. So that's the kind of hearing loss. It's not necessarily that you're going to start to sound like you're underwater. Um, that kind of hearing loss tends to be damage, not, not aging. It is wrong to assume that older patients are blind or deaf. Please don't do this to your patients. If you walk up and start shouting at an older guy in one of our scenarios, uh, you're going to fail. All right. Talk firm, not, not firmly like sternly, but, um, have some good inflection in your voice at a normal volume. And if they can't hear you, they will, they'll tell you or their caretaker will tell you or something. And then you can adjust accordingly. Um, Something you can do, like I said, sometimes it's not about the volume. Sometimes it's about the pitch that you're talking at. So if if a caretaker says that so and so is hard of hearing, ask them: Is it a, is it volume? Do I need to speak louder, or is it a range? If you lower the pitch of your voice, or if you raise the pitch of your voice and still talk at a normal volume, they may hear you fine. It just depends. Uh, visual distortions are common. And hearing loss is four times more common than vision loss. We do tend to lose our hearing because, again, it's not just about the eardrum for our hearing. There's all kinds of structures in your ear that, that do this, and they do start to disappear as we get older. Psychosocial changes in this age group are pretty severe, um, or not necessarily in how they act, but in how they make their decisions. And because of that, we have to be careful with what we what we say, how we present ourselves, how we how we present things to them and, and try to get them to accept our care. Until about five years before death, most people retain high brain functioning. Uh, that's just a statistic, so take that as you will. In the five years preceding death, mental function is presumed to decline. A theory is referred to, or a theory referred to as a terminal drop hypothesis. It's not, it's, it's enough of it that they've, it's, Consider the theory, which is not, a, you know, don't get that confused with hypothesis, but um, it still is kind of a percentage and a statistic. So you do run the, the issue of that doesn't apply to everybody. As the elderly population continues to grow, we have the responsibility to accommodate their needs during their last 20 to 40 years of life. Uh, we live in a time you're working you're going to school right now to work on an aging population that is growing in numbers because the baby boomers or the children of the baby boomers you know after world war ii they're the ones that are getting into this population it's a big chunk of the world population that is elderly at this point <laughs> statistics indicate that 95 percent of the elderly live at home and the increasing number of elderly in the united states as a result of the baby boom of the 40s and 60s has produced a need for additional assisted living facilities. So if any of you are wanting to be business owners, that's something to go into or buy stock in, uh, which if you're going to buy stock in it now, you're kind of on the late end, but it's still, it's still something. Uh, financial limits may restrict access to health care or medications. Today, more than 50% of all single women in the United States who are 60 or older are living at or below the poverty level. Uh, one of the important issues that the elderly need to face is their own mortality. You know, when you're young, we tend to, like I said, just like adolescents, you know, we tend to kick this off to to another time. Like, I'm, I'm only 16 years old. I'm not going to die. You know, the only thing that's going to kill me is old age. I know it's coming, but that's when I'm old. That's like another 70 years from now or whatever, or 100 years in my mind. Or I guess it's not today. So this stupid move I'm about to try, no big deal. Right. But when you're in this age group, um, this is a different thing. Uh, it's, and it, it causes a lot of issues. I'm going to go ahead and read the last part of this. Isolation and depression can be challenges. That goes with the line before it. The elderly, the problem with living to be really old is you watch everybody around you die. And all the people you grew up with, 
all of the family that you've looked up to that's older than you. Um, if you live long enough, you'll see every single one of them pass away. And that is insanely depressing to me, even at my age. I can't imagine what it's going to be like to go through that. I don't want to die early, but I don't want to see everybody I know die either. Um, isolation and depression can be challenges because everybody they know, their entire world, you start to feel like um, it's not your world anymore. Like, I don't know about y'all. When I was in college and I worked at Burger King uh, for, for a time, I actually worked there for a pretty good while. But because of that, all the people that I worked with, I saw complete turnovers. And it was just one day I'm sitting there, I'm looking in the lobby. Uh, I'm on my break and I'm looking back over the counter at the people working with me. And not a single one of them was there when I started. I was by far the longest working employee there. And it was it was kind of depressing. I'm like, man, everybody's moved on. And I'm still here. you know. And it wasn't that I got left behind um, in my career. It was just that I'm, I'm thinking about all the fun times I had with people working there, some of the friends I made and everything. They're all, some of them moved away to different colleges. Some of them just started their career. Um, it got it got depressing. So picture that, but on a massive, um, really horrible scale of, you know, everybody is passing away. That's kind of what they're dealing with. And because of that, you will see depression in, in elderly on a massive scale. And then with that comes issues like drug use. You might see drug use, um, alcoholism, you know, these things. A lot of people don't don't think about the grandmother becoming an alcoholic. Um, we, we think of grandparents as sitting there knitting sweaters and watching The Price is Right or something like that. But um, we don't we don't tend to think about how their how their world is starting to affect them. So. That's why you get those calls where somebody says, you know, oh, I don't feel good. My, 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 my chest hurts. I need, you know, the ambulance to come out here. When you get there, they're like, they're perfectly fine. And we get frustrated with that. Um, we lose sight of the fact that they are sitting there in that house by themselves day in and day out with no interaction. And you are the closest thing that they've got. And especially it's really bad when, you know, the lady you're going to see you remind her of her kid or you remind her of her ex, uh, her late husband and, and, and things like this. Um, so be patient with that. We'll talk more about geriatrics when we get to that chapter. It's actually the last chapter of this course. Um, we'll talk about things to do when you go to these calls, um, things to be aware of, things to change in your, in your, your style of treatment, so on and so on. But um, it all sources back to this chapter and this particular portion of it. So when we get to the last module, which is um, special populations, we're talking about like peds, um, geriatrics, that's going to be those, those chapters. So um, treat this chapter kind of like you treat anatomy. I don't want you to be a master of life, a spent lifespan and development right out the gate. I want you to have a basic knowledge of this because we're going to apply it to the later chapters. But that is it for tonight. The lecture is pretty short because, like I said, a lot of what we do is a lot of what we do will be explained in the last module. So just keep this in mind. The big things I want you to take away from this, because we're going to talk about adults for the bulk of this class, are the vital signs. Um, as we're going through and you're, you're learning all the new stuff and you're doing your assessments and everything, I'm going to give you vital signs and I need you to know whether or not they're normal, high, or low, based on what patient you're looking at. Because if I tell you that somebody's breathing 25 times a minute, um, if they're an adult, that's really high. But if it's a six-year-old, that's not that bad. That's actually in their range. So you have to know that. All right. Um, blood pressures, you don't have to really be so big on the numbers. Just understand the trend, that if they're little, the blood pressure is little with them. And as they get bigger, the blood pressure gets bigger but your pulse and your breathing tend to drop as you get bigger. Um, so again, I use the hummingbird and the elephant analogy. If you can keep those things in mind, typically you'll be okay. The registry, if they want you to have, if they want you to know that a vital sign is really high, it will be really high. So breathing rates being 12 to 20 times a minute, if they give you a breathing rate of 22, you can consider it normal. If they give you a breathing rate of 30 or say four or five times a minute, um, those are obviously way out of range, no matter how you're looking at the numbers. That's the kind of thing. So 
You don't have to be exact. Uh, the textbooks aren't exact. If, if somebody in this class is using a different textbook, you probably got different numbers than what was on the slide. I myself learned different numbers than what's on the slide. But that's it. Um, your, let me give you your pin for the night. Give me just a second. Everybody is going to select the recorded lecture when you do your attendance because you're watching the recording. There's only one person on with me right now that's watching the live. So, uh, Ms. Oglesby, if you are with actually with me, um, you can select the live lecture. It's up to you. But the pin for tonight will be B is in basic. And we will go with seven. Actually, I want to change that. B is in basic. C is in chapter seven. L and D. So B is in Bravo, C is in Charlie, the number seven. L is in Lima or lifespan, and D is in development will be your pen for the night. B, C, seven, L, D. That's it. Um, watch this and class will be at this point. I'll put it in your Facebook group if I change it, but. Uh, Thursday's class will be live as as usual. Hopefully the storm has passed by then and we don't have too much destruction and we'll be able to do it as normal. You guys have a great night and um, I'll see you on Thursday.